Here we go. Here we go. At our church, Jesus is Lord. That single belief calls us together as a community and sends us into our world with hope and purpose. At our church, your past will never define your future. There's always redemption, which means there's always a brighter day. At our church, we don't think we're better than any other church out there. We're just doing our best to become our best. At our church, we want you to believe in God, but we also want you to know that God believes in you. We are not against people who don't attend church anywhere. Instead, we pursue them with love, the very same love that's pursuing us. At our church, we're learning to serve God with all our hearts, and we're learning to worship Him with all our lives. And if you're looking for the perfect church, we're not it. At our church, we will make mistakes, but we will choose to grow from them. At our church, we're part of a global community that's knit together by the resurrection of Jesus. And by the way, at our church, we believe that really happened too. At our church, we will engage with people who are in real need because we are the hands and the feet of Christ. And finally, we need you to hear this loud and clear. At our church, it's not really our church at all. It's His. And we live and move and breathe in His church for His glory and His fame, not ours. So here's the invitation. You're invited to jump in with your whole heart at your own pace and to experience the life that awaits you in Christ. Friends, this is going to be good. Welcome to our church. Well, welcome to the place this morning. If you will, let's stand. If this is your first time, we're so glad to have you. And it's chilly outside, and I'm loving it. Thank you, Jesus. Ooh, I can see the clouds roll in. I can feel the winds, they try to shake me. I will not be moved. My on the rock Ooh, I can feel the waters rise I can hear the howling lies that haunt me Fear won't hold me now My feet are on the rock
You guys sound good. We'll take this show on the road. Is that all right? Yeah. Well, welcome to the place this morning. My name's Brent, and I just spent like 48 hours with Pastor Gary, and he knows way more about me than he probably wants to know. But uh, I do snore. I'm a snorer. He snored just a little bit, uh, but I'm, I'm deaf in my left ear, so what I do is I roll over on my right ear, and I can't hear a thing. It's a beautiful, beautiful system. But anyway, we're glad you're here this morning, and at the place we say that all blessings flow through relationships. So get out and meet somebody and uh, hug a neck and shake a hand, and let's be the church this morning. I'm telling you. So all of you people who may be watching online, because we've got a bunch watching online today, because a lot of folks are out with various various sickness. So all of you folks are watching online, shake hands with each other there in, in at home. The Andersons, uh, several of them uh, have got something, and the, the Millers and... Uh, and when you say the Millers, that there's several different levels and spaces, you know, in there. And uh, yeah, Barb Kilkenny is uh, dealing with COVID, and uh, so. I, but you know, it. Several of you came in in the last few minutes, so you just uh, make making it look uh, much better than I, I feared it might. And all you folks at home, uh, we're praying for you to get well. Anyhow, uh, each week we pray for a various church, and I know you that come all the time have heard this, but for you that uh, don't come all the time, this is something the Lord laid on my heart many years ago when I became the senior pastor at Crossroads. It just is something in my being is what Jesus said the last night, and in, in John records it there in 14, 15, 16, 17 of John. But one of the things he prayed, and he mentioned it several times, I pray that all those who believe in me will become one as we are one. The prayer of Jesus is for believers in Jesus to be united as a family. 
And that's why we pray for a different church, because we may have a little bit different doctrine, but our core value and our core beliefs are the same. And uh, so today, uh, who are we praying? There we go. Pastor Marty and Brenda Williams at the First Baptist Church in Tuttle. And when we don't, we always try to contact them, but when we don't hear back, we just pray a general blessing over them for things that uh, we know that God uh, would want to do in their, their midst. And I might add, today is Restore Christian Church's first Sunday in their new facility over there, the old uh, bowling alley slash uh, gym. And uh, for you that weren't here, it was about last year at this time, sometime around this time, I believe, where we pray for a church every Sunday. We had uh, Pastor Jesse come down because they were meeting just up the block and uh, come down so we could pray for him in person, and then we surprised him. This church gave, him, gave their church $5,000 to help in the remodel of that facility. So well, why do we do that? Because we don't just say we're kingdom-minded. It's really a part of our DNA and who we are. And I, I just, Jesus said the world would come to know him when they saw us love one another. And so let's love one another. So we're going to pray for Pastor Marty and Brenda Williams at the First Baptist Church at Tuttle. Father, I just thank you for this church in Tuttle. Father, I know that, God, the core beliefs that the First Baptist Church have focuses on Jesus Christ. He's the only way. And I, I pray for Pastor Marty and his family. I pray that you would watch over them. I pray that you would provide everything that they have need of. I pray that you would bless them, God, individually, physically, that you'll protect them from any serious illness or accidents. I pray that you would bless them materially so that they will always have enough, not just to take care of their own needs, but also to be a blessing to others around them. But more than anything else, I pray, Lord God, that the Spirit of the Lord will work mightily in their lives. I pray for Pastor Marty as he ministers week by week. I pray for the anointing of the Holy Spirit to rest upon him. And on that church congregation, that when people come in, they sense the love of God in that place. And that many people will come to know Jesus and grow in him because of the ministry of First Baptist Church of Tuttle. So we thank you for them. We pray blessings over them in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen, amen. amen. Well, as I mentioned, there are uh, several people that are out with various, various and sundry uh, illnesses. It's that, it, I almost hate to say it's that time of year. It's like, oh, you got faith for sickness. <laughs> no, I don't have no, but it's a, it's a fact of life, so I don't, don't beat each other up over that. But uh, whenever you hear of somebody, just take time to, to pray with them and pray over them. Uh, I, I shared in, uh, in our discipleship class and, uh, just a brief testimony. I'm not going to go into detail, but because I had mentioned uh, in the regular service a guy that... Uh, I had met out at First Step, and so I'm going to try to say it real fast. So two months ago, I was out at First Step on a Friday night. There was a young man that I met there who had just walked in a couple of hours before off the road saying, you know, because he wanted to get clean. And uh, after we, he was one of the guys that came forward when I prayed for people who wanted to commit their life to Christ, and I sat down with him for about 15 minutes afterwards and just encourage him to stick it out. I found out the next day or Sunday that he had walked out that night. He was there a total of four hours. But I had got his number, and Nick and I have stayed in touch for the last two months. But I've been to Africa. I hadn't had time. He finally got into a sober living house in Edmond. Yesterday, I went up, picked him up, took him to lunch, and uh, found out that he's only, only a mile from... Uh, Spring Creek Assembly, which is pastored by a guy I know. We drove over to the church. It just so happened the pastor was walking across the breezeway as we drove into the parking lot. I hollered at Darren, brought him over, introduced him to Nick, and Nick is supposed to be sitting next to Pastor Darren this morning. 
And those are not coincidences. And uh, as we were leaving, I said, Nick, do you realize how many things had to happen for this event to happen? And we went through them. And he said, well, one more you don't know. I said, what's that? He said, this is the first Saturday I've had off in two months. <laughs> yeah. And then James shared a testimony of him and, and Tim at, at their discipleship times, just talking about the Lord, and the guy next to him begins to ask him, why do you believe in Jesus? And I, yesterday, I, I was just on cloud nine. I was just... I called David, right, David? I said, I got to tell somebody. Because to me, that's what's exciting about walking with Jesus. Yes. It's not just that, oh, I get to go to heaven when I die. Okay. But on the journey, there's so many things that God can and will do if we'll just keep our ears open and our heart open to him. Because it, it yeah. So uh, anyhow. We're going to pray. You got something you want to share? You. You. Come on up here. Because sometimes you say, well. Well, mine is not as exciting, but, um, you know, we t that was exciting. But we have one of our guys today that's hurting. Uh, Dustin's here. And... Um, he shared with me that his brother committed suicide. And so his mother's having a hard time. Mm. But he also shared something that I think that is important for us to know. He said he was supposed to graduate three weeks ago. Was it three weeks ago? And he decided to stay there. And he said if he hadn't stayed there when this happened, he probably would have been drinking again. Mm -hmm. So that's a victory for him and a victory for us. So this morning, I, w I just want to us to lift him up and his family. His mother's having a hard time. Mm -hmm. And this is another family that we can minister to and just reach out to, and, um, and as well as yeah. all the different ones yeah. we have. Uh, because, you know, a lot of us, um, this time of year, we get excited about all that's happening, but there's still a lot of people that are hurting, and during this time, they go into depression. Um, there's a lot of things that happen, and so I want us to be aware of the other side of that, too. Yeah, that, thank you for sharing that. So, Dustin, whenever we pray here in a little bit, why don't you come up and let us pray with you, And uh, because we're getting ready to enter the, the time of praise and worship. We, our, our rhythm is... We open up with a song, then we just have a fellowship time, then we take care of announcements and things like you see us doing, then we move back into, so the rest of the service is focused on worship and then the Word. And uh, when the worship begins this morning, you'll, there'll be some prayer partners up here. They're here to pray with you one-on-one -on -one for anything that, is, that you're going through. And I know some of the needs, like Shirley just shared, and I know some of your needs that I'm aware of right now, but most of you have no idea what is happening in your life. Just know that the God we serve knows and cares, but he has said that we are to bear one another's burdens. Yeah. Uh -huh. We can't do that if we don't know them. Right. And so never be reticent about coming up because here's what happens sometime. Well, my need isn't that big. There's lots of it's not like <laughs> God's got a limited supply, and if you get a blessing, it cheats somebody else out of a blessing. If you get an answered prayer, the Bible says we have not because we ask not, and sometimes we ask with wrong motives. And so th that's what we're going to do. We're going to receive the Sunday morning tithe and offering. Most people give online these days, but some people do it traditionally. Uh, next week, I'll share with you some other things about uh, but I'm not going to spend that time today. And so we're going to pray. We're going to pray for God's anointing upon the prayer time. The worship team's going to come. And we're just going to trust God to minister to the needs of people here. Father, I thank you for Jesus. <laughs> I thank you, Lord, that we, we come and we just gather around the cross. And we look to Jesus who has provided everything that we need for life, not just for eternity, but 
between here and there. And God, I know there are individuals in this place just dealing with some very serious things in their life. We've got friends, God, that we've known, first step friends who have gone back out and aren't doing well. And so, Father, we're just asking for you to come and undergird them. Father, I thank you for the people who support what's going on here financially. We couldn't do what we do. We couldn't go forward without them. So I ask you to bless every gift and every giver in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you want to stand and the prayer partners come. You know, as we play through this a little bit, I just want to say this today that uh, the song we're singing is Goodness of God. And the goodness of God was obviously following Nick, whether he sees it or not. And like even for you, Dustin, when things are, are awful, things happen. But you're where you're at for a reason. The goodness of God, this, the bridge on this song says, the goodness of God is running after us. He's chasing us down. Sometimes we just need to stop and just let him catch us. Because his mercy never fails. And I just want this to minister to you because it ministers to me every time I sing this song. Because I realize just how good God has been to me. Even so undeserved. And he's still good to me. been held in your hand from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God all my life you have been
If you knew me then, you'd believe me now. He turned my whole life upside down. He took the old and he made it new. That's just what the mercy of God came.
Jesus.
came and you found us when we weren't even looking for you. We didn't even know you existed, and yet your love went out ahead of you. It chased us down. Some of us, it chased us down over and over and over again. And some of the, some people here this morning, God, your love is still chasing them. They have, they've pushed you off. They've run from you, God. But today is no accident. Right now is no accident. And God, I believe you're speaking to hearts right now. And if that's you this morning, you know, we don't have to wait for an altar call. You can just say, Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. Take my messed up broken, got shards of glass. Every time I try to handle my life, it cuts me. Take all that, Jesus, and make something beautiful out of it. I give it to you because I've tried everything else. If that's you this morning, man. That, you, you, if you prayed that prayer with me, if you just agreed with me, your name is right now being written down in the book of the Lamb's Book of Life in heaven. There are angels that are high-fiving each other. You might even have loved ones that are there witnessing this moment because they've been waiting for it. So, Father, we just we give you. We give you ourselves. I give you myself fresh and new right now. Right now, Jesus. We love you. We love you, and you love us, God. Amen, amen. You may be seated this morning. I'm glad you guys are here. It'd be lonely without you. <laughs> I remember when uh, our last church during COVID, uh, we, we had parking lot church. We, we didn't have uh, set up for uh, YouTube or anything like that. And so uh, so uh, one of the old cattle guys brought his, his cattle trailer that he hauled hay on. And we would get up on that. And, and uh, Pastor Brett, my pastor, he, he was like, you got to have this experience. You got to preach to a bunch of cars because you'd ask him to honk. And then it was like, meh, meh. You know, and it's super loud and everything, and uh, it was it was it was interesting. So it's nice to have feed like immediate feedback. See, you're, you know, if you're sleeping, go ahead and lay over in the seat. I don't want to see you, but like, but if you're with me, that's awesome. But uh, well, we're doing the Advent season. Uh, Pastor Gary and I are, are tag team in this, and he he texted me like a, about a week ago, and he's like, "Have you ever done Advent?" And I said, "Probably not the way that you're thinking then." And I uh, said, we've talked about Advent, but we've never actually done an Advent season. And so the first uh, week is hope. And Pastor Gary did a great job last week just preaching on the hope of Jesus and the hope of his coming, his first coming and his second coming. And today uh, is, is preparing our hearts and preparing the way for Jesus. And that's the way that I titled it today because uh, it's kind of like, a, you, know, you know, when you're on an airplane, they tell you to take care of yourself first. Otherwise, you won't be able to take care of the person next to you. And actually, uh, in my in my stuff in my office, I have a bunch of boxes still that, that haven't seen the light of day for like four months. Uh, that this week, I'm going to be working on uh, cleaning that guy out and, and kind of getting an office going. But I have an actual, uh, I bought, it was 60 bucks, but I bought it anyway. It was uh, an actual uh, mask that you get out of an airplane with the tubing and the, the little bag and everything. And uh, because you have to take care of yourself first. You have to prepare yourself first before you can help anybody else. And so I want to talk this morning about preparing our hearts and preparing the way for Jesus. If you have your Bible, we're going to be in Isaiah chapter 40 is where we're going to start off at. I've got lots of scripture to throw at you this morning. Uh, but uh, a, a wise man named Arben New Armin Newburn told a bunch of you, you, uh, young pastors, uh, pastors in training at Central Bible College years, and years ago, he said, if you put a lot of scripture in your, uh, if you're in your sermon, at least something you say will be anointed. And so, so I've t I have a lot of scripture in here this morning. But Isaiah chapter 40, verses 3 through 5, I'm reading out of the ESV, and it says that this, it says, A voice cries, In the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Let's just ask God's blessing one more time. God, we just come to you. We want our hearts, like Brother Tim talked about this morning, we want our hearts to be good, fertile soil to receive your word. And so, Father, if there's rocks or, or, or untilled soil in our hearts, God, we just give you permission to come in this morning and to, and to plant the seed of your word in our hearts, God, so that it may grow and produce a fruit. And we, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So it says a voice cries. Well, a good question is who's crying? You know, who's crying about the coming of the Lord? Well, the first time that Jesus came, an angel Gabriel showed up and he talked to Mary and Joseph, if you guys remember that. 
uh, and Gabriel said, you know, he talked to Mary. I think that, that might, be, might, might be the only place that he actually gets named in this whole story, but uh, the, Gabriel, uh, the angel Gabriel talked to Mary, and I assume he probably went and talked to Joseph, too, in a dream. Uh, the, the night of Jesus' birth, who was it that uh, was crying out about the, uh, the birth of Jesus? It was the angels of heaven, right? Can you imagine that night? You know, just out. I mean, I love being out where you can actually see the stars. I mean, usually we're in the, we can see the stars a little bit better than we could in Bartlesville. Like here uh, out, we're on the kind of the edge of, no, of uh, Newcastle, and we can see the stars a little better. But I remember years ago, I was at a lake, and uh, we, were, and we were doing some night fishing with a cousin of mine, and I just remember looking up. And that was like the last time that I really saw the stars, and they were super bright. But you, could you imagine just like, you know, it would be like being in a, at a stadium, all of a sudden that, the light of the angels showing up and, and announcing the birth of Jesus. And then, and then the person that announced the way of Jesus was, uh, I, love, I say John the baptizer. I like Eugene Peterson's message, re, uh, message uh, paraphrase because he doesn't say John the Baptist. He says John the baptizer. I'm like, I like that better. I don't know why. I just do. So John the baptizer, he prepared the way for Jesus, for the people of Israel who would listen to him. Uh, he tried to prepare the way uh, for people that wouldn't listen to him, uh, but they didn't really, really accept it. And then what did Jesus do when he's on the Mount of Olives and he's just about to be taken up out of sight? Who, is he ha- who does he have there but his disciples and all of the people that were uh, his followers? And he, he kind of, I, I remember uh, one of my Bible college professors said that it was like somebody at the top of a mountain and they were packing a snowball and they were going to roll it down the hill. Well, who, who was in that snowball it was all of his disciples. There was no plan B. You realize that? If, if those guys had failed, we would not have the church today. In fact, that is one of the best reasons for the fact that Jesus Christ is alive and well today is the fact that his church still exists. The fact that we are even here. The fact that right now, uh, or this day, over in China, there are people that are meeting in secret because they love Jesus. There are are people all over the world that are meeting in homes and, and meeting in grand churches and small churches and anything in between because they love God. Because he has shown up to them and they have realized he is real. And so uh, he, he pu- pu- pushed these guys together, told them, don't, don't, uh, don't leave until you get endued with power. But that was, that was plan A, and there was no plan B. So now who is it that's crying about the coming of the Jesus? Well, it should be me. I get paid to do this. I do. Which is kind of, it's kind of a, it's kind of a, it can be a double-edged sword sometimes. But I, I did, I, I did wonder, I, I used, to, I still wonder actually. I wonder if God's like, I got to keep Brent real close. So I'm going to have to call him into ministry. <laughs> I got to keep him real close. He's he's liable to he's liable to stray, and so well, it should be me and it should be you, it's like like Brother Tim was talking about this morning. We are the church, and and the pastors equip the saints. But you guys are supposed to just like I am. I'm out and about in the town and everything. I'm learning the names of all the ladies that that give me my breakfast burrito at Brahms every morning. And uh, when I was in Bartlesville, I knew the name of most of the people at the McDonald's because I went through three or four times a week and would get a, a sausage biscuit and a coke. It was like. Two, two something, they raised prices on me anyway, but I still kept going and uh, I ended up uh, bringing a lady to church that, that uh, I had known for five or six years. And uh, so you just, you just go out and, you, and you, you just, you're just splashing Jesus all over the place, you know, and whoever, on whoever you, that you come in contact with. But it should be me, it should be you, it's, it's us, his capital C, the church, right? And uh, maybe you think it would be easier to be a minister, but it's not really because sometimes Jesus can be your job, but he's not your Lord. And we need to be careful about. I need to be careful about that. I don't know what it is for you, uh, that that can it can kind of become pro forma, uh, it can kind of become just a routine. It's one reason I, I like in the assemblies that we don't do communion every week because when you do it, it's special. And and, and you realize you, you almost kind of stumble upon it. You almost kind of have to really grapple with it. And I was actually talking to Brother Darren because I know in next week, not this week, but next week we'll have men's meeting and he's doing First uh, Corinthians chapter eleven, and that's where Paul. Gives talks about communion, and he sets it forward. I talked to Brother Darren. I was like, it'd be, it might be cool if we did communion as, as guys, so we'll, I guess we can talk about that. I don't want me to throw anybody under the bus or, or uh, you know, shine a spotlight on something and, uh, if I'm doing something I shouldn't do. But anyway, um, I love communion, but, but sometimes, you know, if it's your job, it, 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 he doesn't necessarily have to be your Lord, but um, it's a struggle. It, it, it is a struggle, just like it is for you, just like it is for me, carbon time. I was 28 years old before I had a daily Bible reading time, and I'd been a youth pastor for two years. Now, I read the Bible a lot, because you have to, uh, if you're going to give a message, right? But uh, it, took, it took until I just kind of made it part of my habit every day. And over the years, that habit has expanded. 
You know, bef- and before it's a desire, before it's a delight to you, it's got to be a, di- a discipline, you know. You've got to discipline yourself to do it. You have to say, you know what, uh, I know this is good for me. I, I, uh, uh, Smith Wigglesworth, one time a man asked him, he said, I, I don't really remember the things when I, that I read. And Smith said, when I read the newspaper, I come out dirtier than when I went in, because that was kind of the, that was the internet of their day. But he said, when I read the word of God, I come out cleaner than when I went in. And I don't care if you remember all the things that you do, just I, I, I hold my Bible to my, my face, I kind of smell the leather, and I say, God, uh, I, I, it's the verse in uh, Psalm chapter 119, I say, um, make your word a lamp to my feet and a light to my path, help me to hide your words in my heart that I might not sin against you. And I do that very often. And you, some, I don't know what your habit has to be, but if you don't have like a, a pretty much almost bulletproof daily Bible reading time, um, work on it. Pray about it. Say, God, how can, where, where can I do this? You know, some people like to listen. I know Tim uh, would say he hates reading. He doesn't like to read. He likes to have books read to him. And, uh, uh, and, and so I can understand that. But, you know, if you're, if you're trucking around, you got, everybody's got the Bible. I don't know how many Bibles I got on my phone. I probably have five versions that I bought on my phone, and, and then you've got all those other things that you, you can do, so it, anyway, that's free, that wasn't in my notes, but anyway, so he makes, uh, we're supposed to make the, the low places raised, and the high places level, and the rough places a plain, to me this speaks to the fact that we need to make, uh, make it easy to understand who Jesus is, we don't need to put up any roadblocks in front of anybody, we don't have to clean anybody up, did you know that, you don't have to come to Jesus, they can come right where they're at. He's going to meet them right where they're at. Now, he's going to clean them, but that's not your job, and that ain't my job, right? One of the horrible sins of the Pharisees was they made it harder to get to God. In Matthew chapter 23, verse 4, it's going to be on the screen there, uh, Jesus says this. He says, uh, he's talking about the Pharisees. He says, they tie up heavy burdens that are hard to bear, and they lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them even with their little finger. Have you know, I mean, a lot of us have grown up in the uh, different churches, and, and, and uh, you know, there was a lot of legalism when I was a kid. There was a lot of fear, you know, about, about God when I was a kid. I got saved because I didn't want to go to hell, you know, and, and, and no, that's okay. Honestly, that's okay. If that's where you get in at, that's the shallow end of the pool, there are deeper things out there, you will get there, right? So if you're, if you're just like, I just didn't want to go to hell, that's cool, I... Uh, it, the zeal of young people, right? I was, sit, I was in sixth grade. I was 12 years old. I, got, I was in youth group, and I had an amazing youth pastor. Uh, he was, he was, he was kind of like a drill instructor a little bit. Uh, he, was, he, was, he, was a, he was a bodybuilder, and he was a fireman, and he was a great guy, but, uh, you know, he, he, he could be a little harsh sometimes, you know. Uh, uh, There's many stories, but I won't get into it. Anyway, but he was preaching through Revelation to a bunch of kids, right? And, and he was like, share this with your friends. And so, uh, you know how you are when you're a kid, you know, I, I, I had a perfectly good bed, but me and my buddy were spending the night together. His name was Dan. And we were like huddled in my corner of my room uh, by a little nightlight, sleeping on bean bags, right? You know, because you're 12 and you're stupid. So anyway, <laughs> and in the glow of the little nightlight, I'm telling him about like the tribulation. And he, all of a sudden I hear, <laughs> He's like, Dan, what's the matter? And he goes, I don't want to go to hell. I was like, oh, my goodness. I was like, what have I done? So I went downstairs, and, I, and my dad was still up. And I was like, I think Dan wants to get saved. Can you come pray with him? And he was like, sure. And so, you know, and if that's where you're at, that's totally cool. <laughs> I'm at the place now where I'm not afraid to go to hell. i tell you what my fear is now. My fear is now that when I get there, nothing that I did here will matter that I did it out of the wrong motive, or I didn't do what God really wanted me to do. I, I chose for what I thought was the best instead of God's best. That's what, that's what my fear is now. And, and, and because the Bible talks about our works being tried by fire, and, he said, and Paul said uh, that some, there will be some people that everything that they have will burn up. And he says they'll still be saved as if through fire. I like to say the Oklahoma, Oklahoma colloquialism, by the skin of their teeth they'll be saved. And I... I, I I don't know how I'm hoping I'm hoping my pile is bigger than me that's what I would love I'd love if, if the stuff that I've done that will last forever would be bigger than myself that would be awesome uh, we'll see anyway stay tuned right me and you will all be there it'll be great 
But he's talking about the Pharisees. They say they tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with a finger. And then just a little further in that same chapter, verses 13 through 15, Jesus continues, and he says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! He says, For you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces, for you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees! For you travel across sea and land to make a single proselyte, and when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much a hell, as, a child of hell as yourselves. Scary, right? We arrogantly or ignorantly think that we have to clean people up when they come to God, but he does the cleaning. We just make the introduction. I'm gonna, I, I talked about this before. It's one of the things I say a lot, but my $40,000 CBC education boiled down to there's God's job and there's my job. My job is to go and give the opportunity. God's job is to convict and to save. I don't have to convict anybody. I don't have to guilt anyone. I don't have to save anybody. I can't. I can't do any of that. I can guilt them, but that's condemnation, not conviction. Condemnation just makes you feel like dirt. Conviction makes you want to change, right? And so that's what I want in my life. So, so hopefully that you can take that. Uh, Jesus is not hidden. Hebrews 11, chapter, six, verse six, uh, uh, chapter 11, verse 6 and we all know this. I'm going to start it, and you could probably finish it. it. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. First, you have to believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Are just open. He's open to you. You know, the Bible says that we each have a, a measure of faith, and that measure of faith, if if, if it's even if it's, so, it's tiny, even if you can barely see it, it's enough to reach God. It's enough. It, Jesus said it's enough to move a mountain, right? But He responds to those who seek Him. Uh, our, our world got put right side up when he first came, and it needs to be put right side up again because we're counterculture now. I mean, back in the 60s, the hippies were counterculture. Free love and all that stuff. That was counterculture. Now we're counterculture. If you don't think so, <laughs> go someplace and just start reading your Bible. Talk about Jesus at work. It might get you in trouble. You know, we are counterculture now. He needs to come back and put, it, put, put everything right again. God's glory will be seen by everyone. And that used to be like, uh, you know, probably when they read that, where they were like, sure. We have television now, right? We can see what happened on the other side of the world five minutes ago. It'll, it'll start going like wildfire. And we will see it. When Jesus comes back, when he comes back his second time, every eye will see him, right? Uh, but uh, thankfully, we believe, <laughs> we believe in the rapture of the church. I'm a pre-trib guy all the way, pre-tribulation. I don't want to see any of that stuff. Uh, I don't want to stick my big hairy toe over it at all. I want to I be this side. Jesus, come get me. And I tell God all the time, I'm like, today would be a great day, right? Today would be a really great day, Jesus, right? But the, the, the church will see his glory when he comes back to get the bride. He'll be in the air. We will meet him. Uh, I don't believe the church will see tribulation. Uh, reason being, for, for me, 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, it says, For God has des not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through, through Jesus Christ. And the wrath of God will be poured out during the tribulation. If you don't think so, read Revelation. Don't read it before bed. You'll get nightmares, okay? Read it in the full light of day. Uh, Re Revelation is one of those that it's hard to read sometimes. I, and, and, you know, uh, anyway, but, uh, okay, <laughs> back to this. The rest of mankind will see Jesus when he comes back to establish his reign on the earth. But those folks will be terrified because they, uh, he will be coming with judgment. And now I'm going to read like 1 Thessalonians, if you want to go to it. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. It's a lot. Uh, and one of the reasons you don't see a Bible up here, I literally type out all of the scripture. Uh, I feel like it gets it more in my heart. And, and then also I don't have to have like be fighting for uh, real estate up here. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 through 11, reading out of the ESV, says, Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you, for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are, people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For all of you are, for you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night of the, or of the darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love and the, for a helmet, the hope of salvation." 
For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live in him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. So that to me tells me that, yes, there is a horrible day coming on this earth, but we don't have to see it. We can have salvation through Jesus. Now, I do understand, I can't understand uh, the, the mid-tribulation, uh, there's pre-mid and post. So pre-tribulation, Jesus comes back before any of this stuff happens. Mid-tribulation, he comes back before the really bad stuff happens, right? And then post-tribulation, those people are just masochists and sadists and apparently want to have just pain in their life because then they want to be here to see all that horrible stuff unfold. I'm going to be in heaven watching from the big, you know, the, the, the gallery and uh, we'll see, we'll, you know, whatever. We need to make Jesus easy to get to. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 through 3 says this. It says, Working together with him, then we appeal to you not to, uh, not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, In a favorable time I listen to you, and in a day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We put no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be, may be found in our ministry. They weren't trying to add stuff to it. You know, a lot of people want to say, okay, you, you can't do this, and you can't do that, and you can't do this. You know what? My Bible says that you have to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That you need to work it out. You and Jesus together need to work it out. I had a friend of mine. He, he spent a lot of time in the honky-tonks and bars and chasing women. And so uh, we were heading one place one time, and I loved, uh, I loved the guitar player Stevie Ray Vaughan. And I was listening to a little Stevie Ray Vaughan in my car, and he goes, man, that reminds me of the days when I was in the honky-tonks. He goes, could you turn that off? I said, absolutely. You know, for me, it didn't bother me. For him, it did. He had to work out his salvation. I've got to work out my salvation. Now, I do know there are some things that get in between me and Jesus. There are some things that get in the way. Uh, when I was, uh, <laughs> I've thrown away all my music twice when I had CD. I had tapes and CDs, right? And I, I did, a, I did throw away all my CDs twice. And, uh, and I remember, uh, I, I went and bought them all back. Uh, but <laughs> I know, <laughs> idiot, but you do what you do, you know, and, uh, so we were, one of our professors at CBC was going to go to Salt Lake City and plant a church in the middle of Salt Lake City. His name was Dr. Doug Ose, and he was having some special, like, like, his was the only class I've ever heard of that would just, like, didn't have teaching time, but they just had prayer, right? Did you have any of those at uh, Southwestern? Okay, me neither. I wondered if I'm, if like I'm the control rod for the Holy Spirit, right? If I, you know, you know, a, a nuclear reaction, a control rod gets inserted and it kind of tips down the nuclear reaction. I'm like, am I that way for the Holy Spirit? I sure hope not, right? Okay, you guys will look that up later, or maybe you won't think that's funny at all. But me personally, uh, but <laughs> Doctor Ose, uh, some of those classes were, were like just prayer times. But he was having special services at a little chapel at Central Assembly of God over by the headquarters. And I went one Friday night. And it's the only time that I've, well, I take that back. Up till then, it was the only time that I had almost, I would experienced something about, like, being slain in the spirit. Uh, you know, it's not really in the Bible. It kind of is in the Bible. But it's an experience that sometimes just, you know, people just get overcome with God and they just, they just kind of fall out. And uh, I remember uh, Dr. Ose was praying for me. And, and, you know, sometimes when you're, like, you're praying, you're, like, swaying, you know. And I remember when he stepped up to me. And I'm, I'm just kind of swaying. I'm just, you know, he goes, stop striving. And I just stopped. And he, and he prayed for me. And I, and I just, it was like I gave my will up to God and I ended up on my back. I didn't like lose consciousness or anything like that. I didn't see a vision. That would have been cool. But when I went out to my car that night, you know how you, uh, you, you're, you're trucking along. And the longer you're driving, the louder the music gets, you know. And so you get back in your car and you turn it on. And it's like, whoa, right? And so I, I got back in my car that night, me and a couple of my buddies, and uh, after that amazing service, and I, and I turned it on, and on came that music, and the, my first thought, uh, this thought and my finger hitting the off button were like simultaneously, I thought, that's going to get in between me and Jesus. The music that I was listening to at that time. Now again, personal conviction. You've got to decide what that is, and I've got to decide what it is for me. If it's not black and white in the Bible, it's a personal conviction. Don't try to put your personal convictions on me. And I'm not going to try to put my personal convictions on you, right? But, but I just, at that moment, I just like, that's going to get in between me and Jesus, right? And so it, you can go through my phone, and, and yeah, I have some secular music on there, but I have a ton of worship music. And there are, there are times, there are weeks, there are days in the week that I'm like, God, I'm going to give you all my media today. Everything I watch, 
everything I read, everything I listen to. And, and I've gotten to the habit now where I listen to like three or four me- messages a day. I don't know why. I just have some favorite guys that I listen to, but it's better than listening to a lot of other stuff, right? I, I, I feel better listening to that than I do the news. And so, yeah, so I'll listen to some of that. But uh, don't put obstacles like a, a, your, your personal convictions on somebody else. Uh, let them come to Jesus and let them work it out, right? Let's not put an obstacle uh, in, in front of anyone. Uh, if, they, if they need to do it, like if somebody needs to get saved 100 times, let them do it. You know? I, I, I was probably 25 years old until uh, before I stopped every day, Jesus, forgive me of my sins and come into my heart, right? But then one day I realized, well, he's already there. I do need forgiveness of sins, Every day, I mean, you may be perfect and you may not need it. Maybe you need like once a week, but I'm like Peter. I'm like, Jesus, wash all of me, right? You know, and uh, just my feet, my head, everything, right? Uh, but what if somebody needs to, to say that, uh, you know, or however long it uh, is, let them do it with Jesus, right? Now, we can disciple people and help them. And sometimes, like, you could set somebody free from a burden that they're carrying. Maybe somebody else has placed a burden on them, like one of the Pharisees, right? Maybe, and you've got to do this, and you've got to do that, and you've got to do this. And you come along like... That's not in the Bible. You're just, you're just doing like Christian calisthenics that are not necessary, right? Okay, it's getting quiet in here. All right. I remember when I was a kid, uh, we, uh, I say kid, I was a young teenager, or I was a teenager, and uh, my youth pastor had been to, uh, Brook, to New York uh, where Bill Wilson, who's an Assembly of God uh, pastor, actually went through your area, but Bill Wilson, he had a thing called Sidewalk Saturday School. They had a, a bus that they would roll up into the projects, and the, I think the side came down, and it was like a stage, and all these kids would come out, and they would just do like a sidewalk Saturday school. Well, we started doing that in Sand Springs, where I grew up at, at some of the projects uh, in, around Tulsa. And, and, I, and it bothered me because, uh, and we, I mean, we got to know these kids, man. We would roll out every Saturday morning, and we'd do this for two or three hours and take them home and everything. And, and we really got to know a lot of those kids really well. And... And it kind of bothered me that they kept getting saved. Like the, the same ones every week kept getting saved. And I said something to Brother Gary. My, my Gary Rogers was my youth pastor. So, see, I just have Gary's. It's a, it's a thing. It's a theme. It's a theme. I asked Brother Gary, I was like, does that bother you? And he goes, no. He goes, you never know when it's going to stick. If they need to, to do it over and over again until it sticks, until they, you know, just let them. Because they're kids, right? Well, sometimes... Adults can be kids too, right? So let's not put any stumbling blocks or any obstacles in anybody coming to Jesus. Jesus is coming back just like he came the first time. And even though it's not about fear, you do have to say, am I ready? Am I ready? And would I, Do I have anything in my life right now that I'd be ashamed of doing if God came back? And again, you've got to pray about it. You've got to ask God, is this, is this okay for me? What Paul says, all things are uh, lawful, but not all things are beneficial. We, we talked about that at men's meeting this last week. Uh, not everything that you do is beneficial. Not everything that you do, and sometimes it's okay to do it, maybe, and sometimes it's going to get in between you and Jesus, and you have to discern those times. And you have to ask God, what is this going to get in between me and you? Have you prepared yourself for him? When he comes back, what will he find you doing? You know, I had the thought about uh, several months ago, uh, well, actually a couple months ago uh, after Brother Gary uh, offered us the position here, and we were going through the process of getting our house ready, and I thought, what if Jesus came back, like, like as I, I, I finally get the house done, and I worked on that thing like a dog, man, like a dog. I don't ever want to paint anything ever again. I'll paint something for Jesus. I don't want to paint anything for myself ever again, right? Uh, but I've worked really hard. But I thought about this. I thought, wouldn't it be funny, like, if I got everything done and we loaded, like, we went through all of that, loading up the, the truck and getting everything, you know, ready to go, and then Jesus comes back. Part of me would be like, <sighs> okay, I'm glad. I wish I had all. But can you, can you understand that there will be somebody in every stage of life when Jesus comes back? There will be little ones just getting born. There'll be kids going through school. There'll be kids getting ready to graduate high school. There'll be uh, people getting ready to get married, maybe finishing college or starting a career. There'll be people in middle age. I remember 
when we were at, when I was at CBC one day, a huge room. There's probably 80 people in this room, and the professor said, "How many of you guys are actively praying for the return of Jesus?" And one guy raises his hand. He was 40 years old, had just gotten out of the army, and he was on his second career. And the rest of us 19 and 20 year olds, we were not going, "Yeah, I'm praying for the daily return of Jesus." No, because we wanted to what? We wanted to do stuff. We wanted to, to graduate, to get married, to do something for Jesus. But can I tell you something? As long as you are doing what God wants you to do at that moment, and he comes back, that to you is going to be way to go, boy. You're going to hear, well done, good and faithful servant, right? Because you're doing what God wants you to do in that moment. You're not responsible for five years from now. You're responsible for now. Now, you will be responsible when you get there, and hopefully you've steered your ship the right way. But there will be somebody in every stage of life. And, and I've wondered, I wondered when I was younger, will, would I have felt cheated being a 15-year-old kid and Jesus came back? I truly don't think so. And, and, and maybe, and, and here's, hear me out. God is a God of completeness. He's a God of wholeness. I truly believe that there will not be anything, anyone that gets to heaven that will say, I feel unfulfilled in this area. Because God is going to be so all-encompassing, all just blowing our minds. I used to think that I'd get bored in heaven. Anybody else? Because you get bored in church. Some of you are bored now, and I apologize. But we've been bored in church, right? And I thought that the throne room of God would be like a church service. Well, it will be, but it'll be like the best thing you've ever been to. And, and, and I, what I, I truly believe this. If, if, if it doesn't happen in heaven, you can come and tell me, Brent, you were wrong. But I truly believe that the, the throne room of heaven will be the most exciting place in all of the universe. And every time we get to go there, it'll be like the best thing ever, right? I mean, it'll be neat to see your, your family. It'll be neat, be neat to see this house that God's been working on for however long he's been working on it, right? Like, I, I want a, a, a fountain in the middle of my courtyard that has Coca-Cola in it. The good Coca-Cola, right, from the, like the 80s with the sod sugar in it, right? I want a, I, I, I was trying to decide, do I want like one guitar that does everything or do I want like a room of guitars? And I think I want a room of guitars, right? All the things that God knows about you and he knows about me and he's been preparing it for, for a long, long time. And he's a God of completeness. But here's the thing. I truly believe that, that the being in the throne room will be the most exciting thing that you've done in your entire life, every time that we do it. Because God's the perpetual novelty. He's never going to get old. He's never going to be like, well, I've seen that. No, there's always going to be something new in God. <sighs> ah, I'm excited. You, nobody else is. I'll go today. <laughs> but whichever stage that I, I want to be found doing the work of God so that the Holy Spirit has to tap me on the shoulder and go, hey, it's time. That's what I want. I didn't have a dream. I was 18 years old. I, was, I dreamed that I was asleep. Profound, I know. <laughs> and I love it dark when I sleep. Like if there's any light on whatsoever, like we have a smoke alarm in our house that has a little green light. I swear you could almost read by this thing when, like at 2 o'clock in the morning. You know, I have a nightshade that I put on when Jennifer gets up in the morning because I just hate light. But I was dreaming that I was asleep, and it was like Jesus cut through the fat, like, like, like the darkness was felt. And he cut through it, and he grabbed me, and he said, come on, kid, it's time to go. My first thought was, yes, it's real. It's happening. I've heard about it all my life, and now it's finally happening. I was like, yes. And just as quickly, I thought, what about my friends I didn't tell about Jesus? And I woke up, and I rolled over on my stomach, and I started calling out the <laughs> The names of my friends that I knew were away from God. I started calling their names. I remember that dream. I was 18 years old. I'm 47 now. It's almost 30 years ago. But when God comes back, I want him to find me doing exactly what he wanted me to do. So that, I, I mean, you step away from the till. I'm going to go, okay. I'm leaving it, but it's going to be the exact moment that God has for us to do. So maybe you've been putting, follow, putting off following Jesus, and this, maybe this is the first time you're hearing about him, about his returning, or maybe it, you've just been away for a while. He will return. 
He's coming back. This will pass. I love reading missionary biographies. Uh, I love reading about Hudson Taylor, who was the first missionary to China that adopted Chinese dress and custom. And man, I love reading about that. He's been dead for 200 years. I read about him, and I'm like, that was real, and that was his moment, and it's gone. This, too, will pass. Every one of us will see death unless Jesus comes back to get us. This will pass. He's coming back. And in 2 Peter chapter 3, uh, verses 9 and 10, it says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but he is patient towards you. He's been waiting for you. He is waiting until everybody that possibly will to say yes. And that makes it a little easier to live the life that we're living, right? He says, He is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and, when the, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved in the earth, and the works done on it will be exposed. So, if you've been waiting on God, this is your day. Like the verse I shared, look, today is the day of salvation. Don't put it off. I used to think when I had gotten a little older in my late 20s, I thought, I wish I had gotten in a little more trouble when I was younger. Kind of lived a little. I don't know where I'd be. That was a thought. That was an immature thought. It was a stupid thought. It was a foolish thought. Because I, am, I, I guarantee you, I, I do, I know there are moments in my life where God shielded me from knowledge, shielded me from opportunity, shielded me from things that would have, could have irrevoc irrevocably messed my life up. And he shielded me. But, but if, 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 you've just, if you've been pushing them off, today's the day. Maybe you, or you're here and you're, you're starting to let yourself kind of nod off spiritually speaking. Man, shake yourself and wake up. Uh, uh, in in uh, one of the, one of the uh, letters that Jesus gave the Apostle John, he said, do the first things. Do what you did in the beginning. One of my professors uh, at CBC, we have a little time. We have a nice clock on the back, by the way. That's awesome. I appreciate that. It saves me from having to like check my watch or pull out my phone. One of my professors at, at Central Bible College, he had a, uh, when he was a pastor in Erie, Pennsylvania, he had a deacon that had a, an affair. And he confronted that deacon. And the deacon said, I don't love my wife anymore. I love this other woman. And, and, and Dr. Watson told him, he said, he said, if you, he said, if she'll take you back, he said, if you will do the first things that you did at the beginning of the relationship, that's going to come back. And he did. He started wooing his wife again, leaving little love letters and love notes and just dating her again and, and, and finally ended up just madly in love with his wife. And they had a little boy out of, after they came back together. And Dr. Watson said, I go back to that town and I look at that little boy and he just, he, he loves Dr. Watson. He would just hug him. So if, if you feel yourself growing a little cold spiritually, do the first things. Do what you did in the beginning. Rediscover God and your love for him and his love for you. And maybe you're just weary today. Can I tell you something? He's coming to get you. He has not forgotten about you. In the Bible, uh, Galatians chapter 6, verse 9 says, And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we don't give up. And I do know it's hard. Don't give up. Ask God to rejuvenate you. Ask him to refill you. Maybe you, you need to like take a little sabbatical or something. Maybe you need to do something a little bit different and, and just ask God to rejuvenate and fill you up again. Could I ask the prayer partners to come back up, the, those of y'all that, that were prayer partners this morning, uh, and anybody else that would like to. Uh, I just want um, people that, that are cool about praying because uh, I'm gonna, we're going to pray, and we're going to pray again about you know, salvation, because maybe, maybe you felt God before, but you weren't ready, and now you're ready. Uh, but, but if you fall in one of these other categories, like you feel like you're, just, you're nodding off spiritually, or, or maybe you're just very weary, and you just need God to kind of, I don't know, give you a little B12 shot of the Holy Spirit. He does, man. He does. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. Because you love us first. 
you have chased us down. You have, uh, in, in the words of the poet, you are the hound of heaven, Holy Spirit. You, you hound us, you follow us, you, you keep track of us, you never lose sight of us. If you're here this morning and you're like, Brent, I, I, I need to surrender my life to Jesus. It, like I said, it could be the hundredth time, it could be the first time, it could be the fifth time. It doesn't matter to God. He just wants you home. And you say, and nobody's looking around, every eye's closed, head bowed. And just, just look up real quick and make eye contact with me and just let me know. Thank you. Thank you. Many, thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Let's just pray. And just, just be open to Jesus. And just, I mean, we could do a repeat after me prayer if you need to. And just say, dear Jesus, everybody in the room, dear Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you for pursuing me. I surrender to you. Forgive me of my sins. I accept you as my Lord and my Savior. Help me to live for you. In the name of Jesus. And Father, if there's a, if you, if you just like some prayer this morning uh, with, uh, could, uh, Sandy, could you play a little something for us? I'm sorry, I should have said, <laughs> said before. I apologize. If you just like a little prayer this morning, we're just going to spend, a, we're, it's before noon, we're not even at noon yet. Just spend a little time in prayer. If you want to have one of these prayer partners pray with you, just some encouraging, encouragement, just a little rejuvenation in your life. Let him pray over you and listen to him because sometimes God will speak through somebody that's praying for you and, 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 and he'll say something by the Holy Spirit to them, to us through them. And so, Father, if there's anyone in here this morning, they're weary. And they're, they, they, they're just spiritually weary, God. Maybe they haven't thought about giving up. Maybe they have. But, God, I just pray in Jesus' name. God, that you would just, in, just invade their space right now. Let them feel your holy presence, your Holy Spirit, your love, and your acceptance. We don't want to give up, God, but we need help to keep going. Let us be ready. We want our hearts to be ready, and then, God, we want, it, we want our loved ones to be ready. Many, I know there's everyone in here this morning probably have, we have loved ones, God, that are away from you right now minds or their, their faces are on our minds right now God we just we pray that you would use whatever means necessary to save them to bring them to a place of salvation like your word says you're not slow as some consider slowness you're waiting patiently until everybody that will will accept you but there will be a day when that day when it's the last moment and, you, and Father, you will, you will turn to Jesus and you will say, go get your bride. And what a wonderful day that will be for us, but what a sad day that will be for the world because the church will be taken out of the world. And all the, the horrible things that, that the church is holding back now will just, it will just avalanche the world, God. And we want our loved ones to be with us. God, let us be lights shining everywhere we go. We love you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor, you got anything? Yeah, I, yeah Tracy wants you come up here and let's sing that song like you said we're early. Let's all stand and for you that want somebody to pray with you, it doesn't have to be about salvation. We have prayer time before and after. Some of you said, yeah, I, I need to move that way. Why don't you come and let one of our prayer partners pray with you, and let's just spend these next five minutes just worshiping and waiting, worshiping and waiting. It can be any sort of need that you may have. He mentioned you've got loved ones that are lost. None of these prayer partners would love to pray with you for them. He turned my whole world upside down. Took the old and he made it new. It's what the mercy of God can do. Now I'm alive. Story, how I've overcome. It's 
Love 